Hello golf fans, welcome back to the Rotopros Daily Fantasy Golf Preview. I'm Chris Durrell, I'm here with Dane Cheneau, how's it going tonight? I'm good Chris, uh, wish I was in Phoenix going to the races like you. Yeah, it was it was a pretty good day yesterday, the weather was absolutely beautiful there, uh, it wasn't too hot uh, and there was just enough breeze to keep, keep you cool and the beer was really cold, that was the best part. Uh, seeing Joey Logano win wasn't really the greatest, but uh, ah, what do you do? Moving on, but <laughs> on to PGA this week, which I've been very excited for. We've got the Players Championship from TPC Sawgrass. They call it the fifth major. Um, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about last week because I was traveling on Friday, which was the cut day, and for me personally, it was a complete disaster. It was pretty much like I was playing low ball last week. Things looked good on Thursday, had a great day. By the time I got to Phoenix for late Friday night, like midnight, one in the morning, uh, I was pretty much dead in the water. And then I was able to look at my chat uh, a little bit for about five minutes running between airports, and I seen something like you were added to a tilt channel, things maybe didn't go so well. Fill me in on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so Kenny adds me to the tilt channel, but for some, some background on that, um, in, my 30, in the $33 single entry, um, my build was Hatton, Rory, Morikawa, Varner, and then to round that out was um, McNeely and Ortiz. So uh, Maverick McNeely goes bogey when he needed to par 18 to miss the cut, um, and Ortiz needed to bogey 18 to make the cut, and he triples. So, oh no! Um, to say the least, it was an ultimate tilt Friday afternoon. I still ended up on Sunday finishing 198th out of uh, the 1766 um, oh. in that contest with a four of six and probably would have been competing for a win if those two would have got through. Right. Make the cut, make some birdies on the weekend. You're probably sitting top 10 in that looking for the win, like you said, like double your money is is great i mean going into the week thinking you know if i double my money this week that's great but when that happens and you know you would have been up in the thousands of dollars uh a big win in, in you know in your grasp you can see it you can see it if they just make the cut you're like yes it's right there and then it's just it's just grasp from you <laughs> so i i don't yeah i just wake up saturday morning still bummed out um... <laughs> wishing my guys made the cut that's that's the way dfs goes and, yeah it sure know, is move on to the next one Yep, that's <laughs> and the next week is, is a huge week. Like I said, the Players Championship. We've got a a very strong field this week. Uh, we've got each of the top ten players in the world teeing it up this week. We've got forty seven of the top fifty here. Fifth major, the Players Championship, absolutely huge. On a scale of one to ten, I just want to know before we get started, just how excited you are. I'm right up there at a, at a nine or ten. Um, they always, like you said, they said. They always say it's the fifth major, and I'm always kind of on the fence with that, um, whether it should be a major or not. Um, it's got the feel of a major, um, but what throws me off is I'm used to the four majors, and if they ever add this to be one, um, they're going to have to go back, and it's going to throw off all the historic numbers of who has how many majors, and some will have majors when the tournament wasn't actually classified one at the time. Right. See yeah. Ricky Fowler. Yeah, um, exactly. But it is – it's definitely a step above any other regular tour stop, um, which is it's and it's always fun week and full of carnage. Yep, exactly. So um, I, I agree with you. You know, on the fifth major thing, and I almost like this tournament more. I, not the Masters. I'm going to take that right out there. But I definitely it's up there um, with those majors, just simply because we get that such a strong field. Um, on the PGA Tour, you know, with the Masters, you're getting past champions and stuff like that. U.S. Open, you're getting the, the professionals that get to, or sorry, that's the PGA. We get the professionals to play. The U.S. Open, like anyone can enter a qualifier and come in. So we've got a little bit, I don't want to say, it's still strong at the top. The fields are still very, very strong in the majors. But this one seems extra strong just because um, you don't get those added players. Like you really, everyone has to earn their way in. So it, it's a very exciting week. So um, just kind of kicking it off, I'm going to go over just a couple notes here that I've got for the course, which is TPC Sawgrass coming back here. Uh, it's a peat dye, peat dye design. So I'm going to definitely going to be looking at that a little bit this week. Uh, we're on Bermuda Greens again. It's a par 72, just under 7,200 yards. So I mean, the distance itself isn't there, but 
it plays longer. You're looking at um, you, the par fours. You got five of them that are between 450 and 500 yards. So there's going to be some long irons in there, and it's a lot of strategy off the tee, kind of getting into the right place. So those Bermuda roughs run in somewhere around two and a half inches on average. The big thing I have here for notes is the small greens, 5,500 square feet on average, which you know we're looking you know average right around 6,500, 7,000 kind of in there as you know what we've seen a lot so far this year. So these are very small greens. With that, I'm looking a lot at stroke gained approach, obviously but there's going to be a lot of players that are going to miss the green so very important as well for me in my model at least is going to be like scrambling and stroke scan around the green that's going to be a little bit more in my cash model um, because i think the players that de definitely separate themselves from this field and give themselves a chance to win are the ones that are nailing their approaches hitting those greens and giving themselves a chance for birdies because it's a tough course there's a lot of carnage like you mentioned but we've seen winning scores the last, uh, you know, looking at the last five years, minus 16, minus 18, minus 10 was Siwoo Kim. That was a little bit of an outlier. Um, but then we had Jason Day in 2016 and minus 15. Ricky Fowler, like you had mentioned, in 2015, minus 12. So probably looking somewhere between that minus 12 and minus 18 again, I would think. Um, so that's birdie or better percentage is going to be big for me this week. I'll over bogey avoidance a little bit just because there's going to be a lot of birdies. It correlates very closely with scoring as well. So that's what I'm looking at. Water is in play in 17 of the 18 holes. Difficulty ranking. Um, so this is where that outlier comes in as well. It has ranked in the last five years, starting with last year, 20th, 29th, 5th. That was the Si Woo Kim win, 19th and 18th. So I'm kind of looking at it being, you know, about mid-pack in terms of difficulty. This is the second year. Another note I have is the second year this tournament has been played in March previously has been in I believe mid to end of May um, but in May generally so definitely looking at that the rough may not be you know as bad but uh, that's a couple other things I have here before I let you get into some of your key stats no player has ever won back to back here um, so Rory McIlroy will be looking to go there now I'm going to talk about Rory here in a little bit uh, he's definitely going to be one of my favorites and then another thing I picked up off the PGA Tour site, as well as uh, Pat Mayo had mentioned it as well, is 110 players in this field of 144, I think it is this year, have at least one PGA Tour win. So that just adds to that strong field atmosphere um, that we talked about. So I guess for me, my in order, my top three stats are going to be strokes gained approach, strokes gained around the green, and then some par four score and a birdie or better percentage kind of a mix of those two so what are some of the other notes maybe things i missed or what are your key stats this week so it looks like i may have lost dane here so we'll let uh you got me yeah i got you there yeah you're back i that was perfect timing actually <laughs> what are your your key stats some of the things that you're looking at yeah, so one quick thing. I don't, I'm not sure if you saw today, uh, but the PGA is actually um, debating uh, having a backup plan of the PGA Championship coming here later in the year if, if things get worse with the coronavirus. Right. Um, I actually did. I thought that was kind of interesting because this is this is like the fifth major, so maybe they'll actually get a major. Though. Oh, that's exciting. Um, that, that can count as the major here. How about that? Yes. Um, <laughs> but anyway, as far as, as key stats, like you said, uh, smaller greens, um, lots of bunkers, water hazards, cuts usually over par for sure, plus yep. two, maybe even higher, uh, depending on the weather. Um, second year in a row, like you said, it's being played in, in March. It was played in March back 2006 and before. Um, and it's traditionally played a little bit tougher this time of year than it did a couple months later. Um, very tough greens to put on fast and a lot of undulation. Um, doesn't look like there's going to be a lot of wind early in the week, uh, so we should see some decent scoring um, unless that changes, and it obviously can. Um, I do think it will play a little bit firmer uh, than it did last year. Um, I know a lot of guys were hitting more drivers than they usually do here off the tee. There, I don't think there's been as much rain in the area uh, coming in this year. Um, and the overseed of the grass that they do um, now with the tournament being in March helped with that as well. Yep. Um, 
I still think it'll play somewhere in between that, but I do think it'll be a little bit firmer. Uh, as far as key stats, I'm all about strokes gained approach this week. Yep. Um, that's a big portion of my model. Um, par four scoring, like you said, uh, the, the par fives are definitely where scoring happens. Um, but some of these par fours, you're, you need to be able to score on at least tread water around here. Um, looking at around the green, DK points uh, to get some of those, uh, to get some scoring in there and then bogey avoidance. Uh, but the main thing is just the ball striking. Uh, it's a second shot golf course, um, especially when it was in May and, and things were dried out a little bit more and people were hitting less than driver off the course. It really became a, a second shot golf course, but I still think that's the case this week. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, like I said, for, for cash games, I think stroke scan around the green makes sense because you, you don't want to be, and bogey avoidance, kind of a combination of both makes sense because you don't want to be giving up tons of strokes, yep. missing the cut, kind of like we seen last week as well. And then for upside, especially when we're talking about showdown, um, birdie or better percentage, just it correlates so well with scoring, DraftKings scoring, DraftKings points like you'd mentioned. And then especially for showdown, birdie or better percentage is huge because finishing position does not, factor into that scoring in terms of uh showdowns rounds one through three uh four definitely has that so we look at round four a little bit different now before we get into our players if you're not a roto pros member yet make sure to get over to rotopros.com you can get access to our slack chat where me and dane fill you in each and every day of the tournament uh notes news notes statistics uh skeletons for the showdown round one two three and four for the showdowns we've been doing very well on it actually this season and we're going to keep that going that is for members only in the chat so make sure to come and check that out and if you use promo code chris this week you can get 50 percent off uh your first after the trials out you can get 50 percent off your your first payment so uh you can definitely take advantage of that here this week and we do cover uh nba nhl pga nascar mlb starting right away going to watch a bunch of spring training games going to have some uh you know, season preview content coming out for that as well. So make sure to go to roarpros.com, sign up for that today, come in and check out what we're all about. So with that, let's jump in. Let's talk about a few players. We're going to go through, first of all, and we're going to look, we're going to go through the ranges, like the 10,000 range. Uh, we're going to be looking at DraftKings, especially just because, I mean, that's the main site that everyone's going to be playing. So, so we're going to look at that and we're going to go through each price range and just kind of talk about a couple players that we're looking at. We'll try not to overlap too much with players, um, but obviously, as always, there's going to be some players that both of us are on. Um, those are, you know, those are definitely going to be some core plays that you're going to want to look at each and every week. I mean, there's there's a ton of variants. Uh, we're not perfect, but when I always find that when we're on a player together that it's, it's something I t definitely take note of, of what players you talk about during the videos, um, in the chat, in your articles, and cross-reference that with the ones that I came up with early in the week, the ones that I maybe look at a little bit later. And those are definitely guys that I'm going to try and fit into my builds, uh, especially in the 20 max. Um, unfortunately... I think we were both on Patton last week, right? Ooh, definitely. Um, it's a little bit tough for me this week because Arizona obviously doesn't allow DFS while I'm down here, so I had... I had to have someone log in um, at home, and, you know, and, and reserve some spots for me. But unfortunately, I can't play on FanDuel. I can't do any betting. So I'm very sad right now, to be honest, before we get into this. I just want to let you know that I am actually sad that I don't get to play 150 Welcome lineups. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, eh? Um, I had some places reserved, actually. <laughs> I, I won some tickets into the, the Millie Maker, so I'm kind of excited about that because I can't access my lineups and edit them. But unfortunately, I can't enter any more contests. So whatever tickets I didn't win, I'm actually not allowed to to play anymore. So just be playing those. So hoping for the the million dollar million dollar win here. So let's jump in and give you those million dollar picks. So I'll lead off first. Obviously, just like last week, it's going to be probably one of your top plays too. I'm just going to take a wild guess here. Is Rory McIlroy? He one stat on him. I talked about him in the preview. One thing I wanted to touch on. He's seven straight top five finishes. No one has done that since 2000. So that's 20 years. 20 years no one has gone on the PGA Tour with seven straight top fives. I think he had a really good chance of winning. He kind of threw it away last week, but top five is there. You can't argue with that form. He won here last year. He's got top tens in four of his last seven events here. He missed the cut in 2018, but uh, I'm not too worried about that. He's been very good here overall. He's my top play in terms of if I'm paying up 
I don't definitely not going to work in cash games, but GPP that's going to be the guy. I think I'm going to center my lineups around for my Millie maker. Um, but there is some players, and we will talk about it down in the lower ranges. I think we can again go stars and scrubs like we talked about last week. A little bit softer pricing, kind of in that lower range for some of the players, especially on FanDuel. If you're playing FanDuel this week, we're going to talk about some of those players. Roy McIlroy, the pricing is a lot closer. He's $700 more than Ram um, on DraftKings, but he's only $200 more on on FanDuel and only $300 more than Justin Thomas. So. Rom and Thomas are definitely going to be GPP pivots for me, uh, but Roy McIlroy is definitely number one. Thomas would be number two. Rom would be number three for me. What? How are you looking at that 10K and up range? Yeah, I, I rank them pretty much the same as you. Obviously, I'm not going to go over the same stuff with Rory you just said, and, and I'll echo exactly what I said last week. It's always, can you get up to him with, with the value? Yep. Um, you definitely can this week with how strong this field is. You can get some really good players in the low 7K range. Um, honestly, at first glance, though, I am kind of leaning more towards a balanced field. Um, and I'll get into some of those plays in the 9K range. Uh, maybe not a complete balanced field where I don't go down into the low 7s and, and high 6s, but maybe more of a jam a lot of those guys in and then still take some – scrubs if you want to call them that at down at the bottom so yeah that's what i'm looking at this week justin thomas is is definitely my second favorite in that range um in the long term model for me 50 and 100 rounds he actually best rory um he's first in in the in that model um he was third here in 2016 he's been up and down kind of this year um but when he's has a good week it's a really good week he should have won in mexico um, and he, he's a almost a thousand dollars below Rory, so pretty good uh, discount for him. Uh, I'm, I'll be interested to see if a lot of people go to DJ at ten thousand. Um, That's scary. I don't know. It's I don't think I don't think I'm gonna do it. It's it's definitely scary because if a lot of people do and, and he crushes, which he's definitely capable of doing, yeah. um, then then you're just dead. But um, Depending on ownership, I think he'll get between 15 and 20 percent on. Um, I'm not really on him with just. I'm not as high on his form as I am with some of these other guys. Yeah, in terms of Dustin, uh, you know, it, it's it's the old battle of course history versus current form. Current form has been absolutely terrible. Um, course history has been really good. Um, in terms of you know, just looking at. 48th at the WGC Mexico, 10th at the Genesis, so he did pop with the top 10 there, but 32nd at the AT&T Pro-Am, 7th at the Tournament of Champions. Nothing really stands out there. He's actually lost strokes on approach in four of his last six. He lost six strokes putting at WGC Mexico, which is just unbelievable. But like you said, he's a player that could just rebound from that and absolutely run away with the field. We've seen him do it before. So, I mean, if you're fading him um, and he goes off, you're going to be pretty much dead if you load it up on Rory and say Rory doesn't get a top 10 and Dustin runs away with it or not even runs away with it but Dustin wins Rory doesn't and Rory's chalk Dustin isn't you're pretty much going to be dead in GPP you may still get you know like your min cash or whatever but you're definitely not going to be winning the GPP so maybe that's a little bit more of a contrarian way to go in that top 10 range he is the cheapest in that 10k and up range um, but looking at his stats, I mean, I'm looking at just the 2020 season in my model using Fantasy National Golf Club this week. And looking at that and some of my key stats here, he's outside the top 100 and around the green. He's outside the top 75 and birdie or better. He's 80th in par four, uh, the long par four is 450 plus yards. And 74th in strokes gain approach. Like, I just... I can't see myself doing it. I'd rather pay the extra 1700 and go to McElroy and maybe fit in one more scrub like we talked about. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at that top tier as well. Um, Thomas, just one thing on Thomas here that I definitely like from a GPP perspective, if you are pivoting, this is why he's my favorite pivot as well. He's second in opportunities gained and first in birdie or better percentage. He's top 10, top seven actually in strokes gained approach and par four. So he hits on like four of my top stats that I'm looking at. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at that top range as well. So um, jumping into the 9K range, I'm going to let you lead off here with a couple plays that you like. You had mentioned maybe going a little bit more balanced. Who are a couple players in this range that uh, are really striking you? Yeah, first, and I think he'll he'll get fairly 
popular, but he's one of my favorite plays of the week is Bryson DeChambeau. Um, he's a guy that he's the scientist, right? They call him. Um, but the more he plays the course, the more he figures it out. Um, and he really, you can see that progression here with him. He was 37th a couple years ago, 20th last year. His lead in form is there, obviously. Fifth, second, fourth, last three starts. Um, coming off a really strong Sunday um, that should give him some momentum uh, added on to that recent form coming in. So he's he's my favorite in this 9K range. Uh, next is, is Tommy Fleetwood right below him. And you can see kind of how balanced I can start a lineup. I wouldn't mind starting it with Bryson. Um, Fleetwood kind of had an off week uh, last week coming off of, of a hard fought week in the weather and, and things at Honda. Um, where he didn't get it done, um, I could I, I could see that helping him this week, having the weekend off after um, a grueling week at the Honda. Um, he was seventh and fifth here the last two years. I could see this being a place uh, that he breaks through. I could see him uh, doing it at a, a big event. He's been in contention. If, if things fall his way, then uh, Tommy can win a big event, I believe. Um, third – and we kind of mesh these not eight and nine K range together yeah. um, is, is Gary Woodland at 8,300. Um, and this is obviously point per dollar as well. Um, yes. I really like his recent form last couple weeks. Um, of course should suit him. He doesn't have the greatest history here, but he's, a, he's a different player than he was a few years ago. Um, 8,300 is, is a very good price. And from seeing that price and some of the odds he has out there for, even some of these bigger events, the Masters and things later in the year, I can already tell if he's this price in those events, he's going to be very popular for me this year. <laughs> Whether that works out or not, we'll see. Um, but 12th and 8th, like I said, the last two weeks that he's played, um, and he gained 7.6 strokes on approach at the Honda. Um, I really like his, his form. Yeah, for sure. So, I'm looking, number one for me is definitely Bryson. I'm not going to go more into him. Uh, he's got form. He's got course history. He's got the stats. He's number two in my overall model on my sheet. He is uh, top five in my short-term model as well. So he's definitely there for me. Number two would be Patrick Cantley. He's number four in my overall model. He missed the cut here last year, but he's got top 25s in 2017, 2018. Um, and then kind of just looking at his current stats, you know, form coming in. He's fourth in strokes gained approach, 24th in par four scoring. 14th in birdie or better gain that stands out to me he's 16th on pete die courses that's something i didn't put a lot of weight on the pete die courses but they are a lot of them set up the same small greens strategic off the tee kind of thing strokes gain approach comes in heavy there so i mixed that in so he's 16th there 10th in opportunities gain so that kind of backs up the 14th and birdie or better as well the only thing that kind of threw me off him a little bit and i'm not Overly concerned, I guess, would be the putting. He's outside the top 100 in strokes gained putting on Bermuda Greens, 89th in bogey avoidance, and 123rd in the par fours from 450 plus. So that concerns me a little bit. But again, I think the rest of the model, which is more weighted towards the strokes gained approach, the par four score, and the strokes gained around the green, um, that's definitely something that I'm going to be looking at. I do like it. I think he may be a little bit lower on just because you got DJ right above him with that that awesome course history and then below him like you said Bryson DeChambeau I think is going to be if I had to guess probably top three top four in ownership this week so I think he kind of makes a good pivot and then I agree with you on Fleetwood I hope that people see that he missed that cut and really because he was high owned last week I hope that those people avoid him and he gets a little bit lower ownership because I 100% agree with you he has been good here he's a good ball striker overall and uh, I, like you said, I think this is a place he could definitely break through. And looking at that missed cut last week, uh, seeing as you're wearing that Wells Fargo shirt, that beautiful shirt you got on there, he hasn't missed a cut on the PGA Tour since the Wells Fargo back in May of 2018. That's a long-ass time. <laughs> so I, I'm definitely on sign. him. It's a sign. <laughs> it is a sign, yeah. You're wearing the shirt. It, it's, just, it's all coming together for Tommy this week, I think. Um, so GPPs, I'm definitely going to be heavy on him. And then another player... Um, that you didn't mention kind of in that uh, 8K range is Hideki Matsuyama. He's actually third in my model. The putting really concerns me uh, with him. He's 143rd in strokes gained putting on Bermuda greens lately. So that really concerns me. But looking at the rest of my model, he's top five in 
And this is, like I said, this is just the 2020 season sample size. So going back to the fall season in uh, September, October, he's top five in approach, par four around the green, birdie or better gain opportunities, uh, top 10 in the long par fours. He's top 25 in strokes gain total on Pete Dye courses, fourth in bogey avoidance. So the, the putting is the only thing that concerns me there. I've got him as a GPP play as kind of a pivot, but I mean, he's got the course history here as well. He missed the cut in 2018, but he's got two top 10s in his last four, top 25s in five of his last six. So that's kind of a guy I'm going to be uh, keying in on for my GPP builds. I might even move him into cash. I'm not 100% yet. I'm definitely going to be leading off with Bryson for cash right now. That's going to be my top guy. Probably going to be a Bryson guy in terms of one and done as well. Um, Last week was kind of a bummer for me in terms of one and done because I ended up going with Stenson. He was my play. I always go in and set a play so that if I forget, at least I have someone and I don't get a zero. Well, this week I did that. I was going to switch it up, um, but unfortunately I didn't, and he absolutely tanked. So I'm kind of dropping down the one and done list, but that's that's the way she goes, isn't it? So come join me. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm trending down towards you. You're probably gonna <laughs> I was all braggy the week before, so I kinda I maybe screwed myself there. <laughs> I should have knocked on wood after talking <laughs> all high and mighty about being top twenty five in the GUP contest after uh, the first segment. So the second segment <laughs> hasn't started so great. But you mentioned uh balanced build. I do agree with this, and that leads us right into the 7K range. I'm just going to quickly go over four players that I like. I'm not going to dig deep into them because I think maybe we're. I'll maybe touch on two of them, and I'll let you touch on the other two because I'm pretty sure we're going to have some guys that are going to overlap here. Um, Morikawa is one. Like it's, me and you have been on him all year long. He's still not missing a cut. He popped with the top 10. Um, so that, that was really good last week, seeing that as well. Uh, Matt Kutcher. Um, definitely going to be there for me. He's got excellent course history. He's won here. He won here back in, I think it was 2012. So i uh, definitely liking that. And then he's coming in with some form. He's got a, a second and 22nd in his last two tournaments. He's a steady cut maker, and getting him under 8K just feels like a bargain for cash games in terms of points per dollar. And then going down a little bit, looking at Mark Leishman again, I had an outright on him, so it was kind of a bummer last week, but he played very well. He hasn't done so well here in the last four years outside the top 60 in each of those event, in each of those four events, missed the cut twice. Before that, he had top 25s and three straight, including a top 10 in 2013. Like I said, he's coming off some good form. He looked really good last week, so I'm definitely going to be on him. And the last guy I'm looking at is Billy Horschel. Again, course history, hitting a lot on course history, but he's made four straight cuts with two top tens. So that's that's I mean that's four guys that I'm definitely considering as core plays, and you could really start a cash game lineup with those four, and you know you could almost fit Bryson in there and be able to have a very solid lineup. So how are you looking at this? Let's just break this up into say like 7,500 and up range, kind of in that range. Even if you've got a guy lower, that's fine. Who are you looking at? Yeah, who was your third guy? I'm sorry, I was. Yeah, I went. Uh, yeah, I went Morikawa, Kutcher, Leishman, and Horschel. Yeah. I went four. I, I went over the max. I'll see myself Leishman. out now. <laughs> Leishman. <laughs> Leishman's the guy. Uh, yeah, didn't hear. Anyway, yeah, Morikawa. Um, like you said, I mean, I think this place should really fit him um, with how. Oh, looks like we lost Dane here. Um, so Leishman was the one. I know he's going to be on Morikawa. Um, he's been on every single event this whole year. He's top 25 in my model. I haven't, compl- I didn't completely touch on him. I was going to let him touch on his, f- I'm not going to say his favorite player, but pretty close. I was just touching on Morikawa. <laughs> Is Morikawa on your list? Did yeah, I call it? I was just... Yeah, he's first on my list. Um, like, really help him here he's shown how he can really score on those Um, i won't go much more in depth leishman i think he'll be really popular at this price 7600 um and uh um, i'm not in love with this 75 to 79 range other than uh morikawa there's a couple more guys that um in the lower range that i really like um hatton is the guy for me that i'm i'll be interested to watch his ownership he could be a complete disaster um, this week after he parties all week up until Wednesday, I think he said he was going to, and, and I definitely believe him. Um, he's been playing great, though, since in, the, in these two tournaments that he's yep. been back. Um, 
doesn't have great history here. That's kind of another thing that puts me off of him. Um, two straight missed cuts. Um, but he, he's a guy that I really want to watch the ownership and probably go the opposite way. Um, here, you don't really – really want to be playing guys who are just massive chalk I don't believe um even if no matter what their recent form is um right and Hatton has the possibility to become massive chalk but he also has the possibility of everybody thinking that and it going the complete opposite way um and a, a guy at 7,500 I like is Scheffler he can he can score um solid last week I won't go much in depth on him uh, where I really like it is this bottom 7K range. I'll just list a few guys uh, that I like. Uh, Van Ruyen, if he gets back to where he was in Mexico, Tita Green, uh, this place should really fit him. Berger has been in great form. Um, and also like Matt Wallace. I really think his game is coming around. Um, last week he was he he was decent, Um Struggled like everybody did over the weekend. He was 30th here last year. He's, he was good here in the in the Florida swing last year. Um, I think maybe he can build on that. And maybe this Bermuda suits him. Uh, so that's that's my lower 7K range I like. Um, and I think also Fitzpatrick is going to get pretty popular. Not sure what I'm going to end up doing with him. Nice. So a couple of players I'm looking at. I'm just going to cover the whole bottom range. I've got a couple of players and I'll mention them. We'll kind of wrap things up here. We're kind of hitting that 30-minute mark. First of all, one that I'm looking at, kind of 7,100, lower 7K range here, is going to be Ches Revi. He's got he's up and down course history overall, but he's coming in with three straight top 30s. He's been very streaky because before that he had missed three straight cuts. But his approach game I always like. And uh, like I said, he has had some success here, even though it has been very up and down. He's 45th in my model, but the strokes gain around the green really stands out for me. That's one place uh, that, that really stood out to me. And with the approach, as well as that strokes gain around the green, I think he makes a cash play. I mean, if you're going up into that, that high range and maybe going a little bit more stars and scrubs with that, that really helps in my model. Um, good drive percentage there as well, driving accuracy. So, I mean, he's going to be on the fairway and going to give himself a chance. So that's definitely one I'm looking at. Um, going down a little bit further in 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 the 6K range is going to be uh, Joel Damon. Especially, I'm just going to look here. I believe, yeah, on Fandle he's 8,100. On DraftKings I like him a little bit more. He's 6,600. He's 13th in my overall model. Looking at his stats on the sheet, he's 10th in strokes gain T to green. And... I mean, he's down here in 87th in pricing, and you get a guy that cheap that is 10th in strokes gain T to green. And my stats in my model now on my sheet are 95% 2020 season or 2019-2020 season and 5% kind of looking back at the 2018-2019 season. He's 14th in strokes gained um, ball striking as well, so that stands out. And then he's 40th in strokes gained around the green. So, I mean, he's covering all those strokes gained areas that I that I'm looking at. And then, you know, digging down a little bit more cheaper. I guess he's kind of in that same range, but on FanDuel especially, digging down uh, minimum price. Taylor Gooch, the the price doesn't really make sense at 7K when you've got other guys around the mid-8K range in that same... I kind of compare the DraftKings price and then go look at the FanDuel price. You can kind of see that in my coloring on the sheet. He's he's just too cheap. I mean, he missed the cut here. Last year, 111, so he did, he didn't even miss it by a little bit. He was actually pretty terrible. But coming into this event, he's gained strokes in four straight um, in terms of his approach game. He's gained strokes off the tee and approach together in three straight. Um, and tee to green, he's gained over 11 strokes in his last three as well. And he gained 5.6 strokes putting at the Arnold Palmer. I don't see that happening again. But he's also gained strokes putting in three of his last or five of his last uh, six events. So. It just seems to be too cheap. Like I said, I'm probably going to have more. He's more of a cash play for me on FanDuel. I'm going to have to check the ownership because if he's going to be high owned, I don't mind eating the chalk in the top range. But when we get down to these cheap guys in terms of variance, especially at a course in an event like this, if he's going to be high owned, I will fade him probably in GPP and end up pivoting somewhere else. Um, And a, a pivot that I really like is Harold Varner. Again, you were on him last week. He just, he's, He's coming off a 13th, a 42nd, and a 36th. At that price, that's excellent. That's something I'm definitely looking at. It's the approach game right now. 
He's gained his last four events. He's gained 2.6, 1.8, 4.5, and 2.7 strokes on the field. Um, that's incredible. Uh, the putting hasn't been terrible. A couple events at the Honda and the Waste Management, he lost over two strokes putting, um, but it hasn't been terrible. I mean, that's not his strong suit. And he missed four cuts before that, so it's kind of more of a GPP play for sure, but he's definitely a guy that I look at from a birdie or better percentage perspective. When he gets hot, he can make those birdies. So if he makes the cut, I think he can really help you on the weekend. I think he can go out there and put up you know, a low score either on Saturday or Sunday, possibly both, and uh, I think he's got top 20 upside here, so they're definitely looking at him. He missed the cut terribly last year, but again, top 10 the year before, 35th in 2017 there. So he has had some success here. He's coming in with some form, and he's a guy that can definitely score for you in terms of DraftKings scoring. So those are definitely a few guys that I'm looking at in that low 6K range. I think you can definitely make a case for paying up for Rory at 11.7 on DraftKings. And then, you you know, in terms of FanDuel, if you want to maybe go like Cantley, DeChambeau, or pick two players in that 9K range, you can start a lineup with that very easily and, and just jump into those two guys down in that 7K and below range. Anyone else that uh, yep, we maybe sure. didn't discuss? Um, the main two guys I like down here for GPPs are, are Varner, like you said. I mean, he's a East Carolina guy. I won't go. There's Bermuda grass in North Carolina, um, and along that whole coast, it's it's a lot of Bermuda courses. So he should be used to the to that, and he's got good history here. I won't go any more yep. in depth on him. Really like him. Um, last guy is Max Homa, 6,600. Um, really like his lead-in form other than the shank chip last week. Um, <laughs> yeah. Very nice price down here. Um, it's his debut here, but he's been on fire to start the year. Gained 6.2 on approach last week, and he's gained on, a, um, on approach in five straight tournaments. And just listen to these last five finishes. Ninth, 6th, 14th, 5th, 24th. Um, just on fire, um, playing yeah. the best golf of maybe his life. Um, Sixty six hundred is too cheap. Uh, with with Domin, I, I do really like him. I agree with you. I mean, he's eighth in my over my overall model, and, and sixty six hundred is pretty insane. He should be in the low sevens at least. Um, he, he's probably going to get mega popular in GPPs. I I think. Um, but he's definitely another guy with Hatton that I really want to look at come Wednesday night, and that's something I'll update uh, my thoughts on in, in the Slack. Um, if it's not out of control, and by out of control, I mean guys in the 6K range over 10%. Yes. Between, if, as they approach 15%, is kind of out of control. Yep. Um, but if he's right around 10 or, or so, uh, I don't mind him. But once he starts getting a little higher than that, Maybe I'll look at a fade at that point. I agree with you there. That's something definitely from a GPP perspective that Wednesday night is something to really, really dig into. For cash games, I 100% agree with you. And you could really, you could pair Homa and Damon together, both 6,600 on DraftKings, and then you can pretty much go any route you want. You can pretty much fit three or four players from the 9 and 8K range, the high 7K range, get up to Rory if you want, Justin Thomas. For cash games, I absolutely love pairing those two low-end guys together to be able to get to some of those upper guys. I think it gives you a great uh, lineup construction this week in cash. But, yeah, like you said, for GPP, definitely going to be looking at the ownership for those two especially. And if they're going to be over 10%, between 10 and 15%, it might be worth fading. Uh, one guy that I would probably fade to, uh, Andrew Landry, I like, stands out in that range as a possible fade. He's always like 2 to 3% owned tops, it seems like. So that would be one fade. So definitely. And uh, Wednesday night, you're definitely going to want to join us in the Slack chat. Uh, like I said, get over to rotopros.com, sign up today, get your free trial, use promo code Chris, get your 50% off your first payment, and uh, join us Wednesday night as we go over some ownership projections, some GPP builds, and we release our skeletons there as well for round one showdown, as well as the full tournament. Um, I do FanDuel as well. And tiers. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, DraftKings introduced some tiers to the uh, PGA format this week, which is awesome. I've been playing a lot of tiers with a little bit in NBA, a lot in NHL, and then uh, it's just a great format. I love it for cash, and it looks like the contests are kind of set up that way for cash. There isn't a lot of great GPP ones. I think they're kind of, you know, play it out and see 
what the interest level is going to be like before they start cranking it up. But I, I believe by the time we hit the Masters here that uh, we're going to see some bigger contests for tiers. So definitely come in, check that out, yep. get all of our content. Um, Dane's article is going to be out, I believe, tomorrow night. Um, so you're going to want to check that out as well. You can check that out at rotopros.com. So thanks for joining me this week. Pretty excited to get started and build lineups tonight. And uh, we'll see you all in the chat. Let's hit some green screens. Have a great week, everyone. Yep, good luck, guys.